Northern Brewer takes you where home brewing and craft brewing meet. From pro breweries to home breweries, we live and breathe beer. Craft beer celebrities, homebrew luminaries, brew sessions, and most important of all, lots of great beer. You are watching Brewing TV. Hello, I'm Michael Dawson from Northern Brewer, and this is Brewing TV. I'm here on the porch for some tasting notes with Chris England. Chris, what, are we, what are we drinking? Uh, we're drinking a double IPA that Mr. Nathan Explosion Smith and I made at the Northern Brewer Minneapolis store. It smells fantastic already, but right. before we tell you how it tastes, let's go back in time to the brew day. I propose we cease shucking and cease jiving and get back, get back to the recipe. A little shimmy shake. I brew. All for brew. Brew for all, baby. Nathan Smith is one of our favorite BTV homeboys and co-hosts. An award-winning home brewer from the Bay Area, you first met Nathan in Brewing TV episode 32, A Day Around the Bay. Back then, we were brewing a double IPA on his turf. This past winter, Nathan flew home to Minneapolis, where he brewed another beast of a beer for a demo at Northern Brewer. Before we get started, we have to show you these precious pictures. A, because Nathan's mom was cool enough to bring them to us, and B, because Nathan's not here to stop us. Look at little Nathan Smith. So cute and so innocent. What the heck happened? Explosion IPA, which is a new double IPA created for this brew session at Northern Brewer. Uh, based on the, the moniker that Kristen gave me for the Upper Mississippi Mashout, Nathan Explosion Smith. It's a dry West Coast style IPA is the idea based around Columbus Centennial Simcoe. It'll be about 1075 original gravity, hopefully around 1010 to 1012 finishing. It should be about 8.5% alcohol and about 90 IBUs. Columbus Centennial Simcoe, so you have Columbus for kind of the dank side of things. Uh, Centennial with fruity and citrus and Simcoe for the pine and and to fill in sort of the other elements of dank and fruity as well. Should make a nice beer. Yeah, there's two yeasts being used, a batch split. We'll do a classic 1056 for one of the carboys, clean California neutral yeast. And then the other carboy will have uh, West Yorkshire from uh, Y yeast. I've never used that strain before. Kristen was a fan of it, and we've talked about how that could be excellent for an IPA like this. It, we'll kind of split the dry hop too, based on these two different yeast strains. We'll go a little bit more fruity and tropical fruit for the the English strain and, and go a little bit more pine and dank for the Cal Hill uh, 1056 one. Sort of cool for men, aiming for about 65 degrees on each or, low, or a little bit lower to get a low amount of esters, but of course we'll want a little bit of esters coming from the English strain to add some complexity as well. Yeah, I've never done this kind of thing before where I'll brew the beer and never really see it ferment or never really see the other, the other side of it without it being sent, so it's pretty cool to have the opportunity to do that and get some bottles sent too, which is awesome. So Chris is getting all the hop additions lined up. There's six hop additions total, I believe. So it takes almost more time to weigh out the hops for a beer like this than it does the grain. <laughs> You'll spend a lot more time getting everything all lined up. So, so Chris is doing uh, all the Columbus and Centennial and Simcoe measuring for the beer. It's actually pretty simple in terms of bittering. We're just doing a 90 minute and a 30 minute addition for most of the bittering, going kind of mellow there and then really loading it up towards the end. So um, I really like that technique. I think it works really well. You can load up the flame out edition and the, the late hopping editions and get a significant amount of bitterness there and get only add a little bit of isomerized bitterness at the 60 and, and 30 minute editions and then get equal if not even more from the later editions than that so it tends to help build uh, the hop oil hop aroma and flavor character in the beer the grist for this beer is about 50 50 maris otter and american two row just slightly more american two row than maris otter it's about 30 pounds total and uh, just a little bit of English crystal, about half pound to kind of round that out. We'll do a fairly attenuative mash in the 149, 150 range. Uh, you know, it's a very simple malt platform for the beer. Don't want it too chewy or too sweet. You want to let the hops stand forward in the beer. Look at that. Kristen carries around a burly knife. Tough I'm man. I'm Hungarian. I gotta defend myself. <laughs> See, once Gordon started talking to it, the mash like behaved right away. It was like, Gordon's here, we better shape up. Uh, corn sugars can help dry out the beer a little bit. Um, 
kind of complement the low mash that we're doing in the beer. We'll get some of our fermentables from, from just simple, simple corn sugar. So, technique that popularized by folks like uh, Vinnie Schlerzo at Russian River is what he'd done on beers like Planet of the Elder for many years. Originally because they just didn't have a lot of space in their mash tun to fit extra grains, but it actually turns out to be a really good technique for brewing beers that you want to help attenuate a little bit. Not too much, we're talking maybe five to 10% of overall fermentables uh, as corn sugar, similar to what maybe Belgian brewers would do for a real nice triple or a golden strong or something like that. So you can have negative effects if you go too far with it, but just a little bit can help, help attenuate the beer. Oh, it's really good. Let's check out 15 Simcoe. No cat pee here. Smells great. Centennial. Nice and citrusy and fruity. It's kind of got that Fruit Loops thing, like real fresh lime oil sort of deal. Really good. Five minute edition. Centennial Columbus Simcoe. Oh, that smells good. I'm thirsty. Kind of getting to be like the celebrity spokesman for the double IPA. What else does Nathan Smith like to brew? <laughs> I like to brew actually almost everything you could think of. I, the, probably the only thing I don't brew a lot of is, is a lot of German Hefeweizens and be, beers that kind of use those yeast strains. I, I enjoy them, but I don't, I don't typically brew them all that often. Almost everything else, I like brewing Belgian styles a lot and German styles. Having a good ordinary bitter or a Kolsch or, or a, you know, just a really nice uh, best bitter maybe or a English uh, barley wine or a Belgian single, all those are great. A double IPA was something I had a lot of uh, recognition for in, in, in competitions, so I like talking about what I think works for the style, and if you want to uh, create a West Coast IPA, here's what I've found that works, and a lot of people seem to be really interested in that as a style, so I'm more than happy to talk about what I think works well. I just, I'm from the West Coast, I just add hops, I don't know how to do anything else, so I'll do that part right. Mash is almost done, about ready to move on to research and sparge here real soon. We're going to use a hop we're not using in the rest of the beer, we're going to use crystal. And there's a little bit of half-assed science behind this actually. It's like if you oxidize the, the sesquiterpenoids in, in noble hops or noble hop-like derivatives, you could add, there's actually been some research done on this in continental Europe and Germany in particular that that can actually help enhance not only foam stability in the beer, but you'll get some if, of those oxidized hop oils that will help enhance the uh, fresh noble hoppy impression that you get when you smell the beer. So we're going we're gonna to add these to... Uh, add these to the sparge water for fun. It's not a West Coast IPA if we don't waste hops in a, dubi in a dubious sort of way here. So normally something you'd probably want to do on a Kolsch or a, maybe a uh, you know, Northern German lager or something like that, a, a classic German pills, but this may help actually fill out some of the uh, aroma profile in a noble way that wouldn't come from American citrus hops. Color looks nice, smells really good. We get a little bit of maris otter coming through in the aroma, but it's, it's pretty minimal. It just smells like a nice fresh mash with honey. American two row. Yeah, a little bit of honey-like quality to it. No, no honey malt or actual honey added, but it, you get, a, you get a, like, a light honey-like impression from the malt. Fairly light golden color to it. Not a lot of color in the malts being used in this mash, so it's be fairly light in color, fairly neutral. So there's three main hops driving this beer, Columbus, Centennial, Simcoe. Columbus would be used as mainly the bittering hop at, thrown in at 60 and 90 minutes. Uh, Columbus, Centennial, and Simcoe fill out the hop profile of the beer pretty nicely. We've got uh, Jake here sending all the hops around so people can smell them. They smell really good. They smell like fresh crop year, 2011 versions of each. We don't know for sure, but it, it certainly smells like it to me. Centennial's at 10 minutes, so if you, you smell the one that's at 10, that's Centennial. 15 is Simcoe, and uh, 30 and 60 are uh, CTZ. So if you've never smelled those in isolation before, they're CTZ is really unmistakable. You smell that one, the, a lot of that dank, kind of earthy, slightly onion and garlic quality to it. So we added these crystal whole hops to the sparge water for fun. And now we're kind of evaluating what it might have done. You can get a slight noble or black pepper spice out of the, out of the aroma. So it might do something, but we're probably just gonna volatize all that off here when we start boiling, so it's, it ain't gonna do much, but. It certainly makes the, the area where you're brewing smell really good, so we'll do it for that, if nothing else. And a slight hop flavor too, but not much bitterness there, I wouldn't say. Looks like we're at about 
13 and a half gallons or so. We're trying to hit about 10 gallons finished at the, at the end. Maybe it'd be a little bit less, probably about nine and a half or so. We're looking for a starting gravity of about 1075. And uh, we'll take a refract reading here in a minute. I'm stirring up the sugar, the simple sugar, the corn sugar that we added earlier and trying to just get a more uniform solution right now so we can take a good reading in the refract. This is real, this is not yeah, this is perfect. About 14 and a half Play-Doh, start to boil. So right about where we want to be. minute hop edition, more CTZ, here we go. Ten minute hop edition. Last hop edition going in, about ready to cut the flame, go to Whirlpool here in a minute. Nice blend of Centennial Columbus and Simcoe. Stir these in a bit, make sure we get good distribution of the hops throughout solution. Just get a nice direct hop punch of American citrus forward hops, nice clean alcohol, enough malt to balance the beer but not sweet, not cloying. Be, this would be a double IPA, probably around eight to eight and a half percent alcohol. Should be nice and drinkable and dangerously drinkable without being uh, too sweet. Should be able to put down a couple pints of this and uh, not feel too full, but enjoy every moment of it. So we pumped the wort through the terminator, we got it down to 63 to 64 degrees, pitch yeast, and now we're going to oxygenate for about a minute. We'll let this beer ferment for two, three weeks, it'll get two different dry hops. I unfortunately won't be here to taste it when it comes right out of the fermenter, but we'll do everything we can to get a few bottles. I really look forward to checking out this beer, it was great to brew here, and the, it's such a beautiful brewing setup, it is like way less work than my hack together setup, this is awesome. That looked like a pretty awesome brew day. Extremely awesome brew day. Unfortunately, Nathan couldn't be here for tasting day. Nathan. Nathan, we've got a picture for proxy, and I will. I can't fly in just for a day for no reason. Come on, man. I'll be I'll be his surrogate taster. I'll take that bullet. Perfect. So the 1056 is the kind of the standard yeast, you know, the one everybody pretty much uses for the double IPA, and it really accentuates, I would say, the hops. If you want something that, that really has nice hops, I mean, it really can do anything, but the hops, especially, especially in these double IPAs, it's really good. So yeah, we can start with that one if you want. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. You bum. <laughs> it's for you, Nathan. There you go, buddy. So the dry hops in, the, in this one, uh, Nathan wanted some Columbus, Centennial, and Simcoe. It, it was about two to one to one of Columbus to Centennial to Simcoe. It was about uh, two and a half, two and a half ounces total. We split that in half and did the first half for seven days, took those out, and then the next, the next half for another seven days, so, so 14 days total of dry hop. And the, the 1469, when we get to it, um, it, was, it was two to one to one of, of Simcoe, Centennial, and Citra. So the new Citra that everybody absolutely raves about. I don't like it all by itself, but it does a really, really nice job of being kind of a blend of stuff. Mm -hmm. So this 1469, the Simcoe is, is the kind of danky, piney, right? The Centennial we want to keep kind of the same, so you had, you know, the standard Centennial, grapefruity, really nice citrusy flavor to it, and then the Citra to kind of come up on the end and kind of brighten things up. And the first thing you'll notice between these two beers is the elegance of the kind of 1469. Whereas the, the 1056 is, is all hops, it's right there all in your face. It's bitter up front and then it kind of, kind of fades away and it has this really nice bitter flavor and really no malt or anything. Whereas the 1469, it's not that bitter up front, but the bitter kind of comes on and it keeps, keeps building. I really like this yeast because you get you get a lot of the malt in this one, but it does it's not too malty. Right, was you was it the same weight of dry hops? Everything, every, everything was the same, same weight. We didn't we didn't base anything on the oils. It, the hops are much more pronounced in the 1056. Yeah, absolutely. It's just it's hard to believe that the 1469 had the same amount yep. of hops 
yeah. dose, like the dry hops, even they're much, much more subtle. Pungent, yeah, it's much more mm -hmm. pungent than 1056. And the same same can be said for the kind of the malt in 1469. It's not mm -hmm. malty by any means, but it's got that nice kind of biscuity sweetness mm -hmm. on the end that that kind of cleans everything up and make it not just kind of a an alcohol hot pony. The thing I like best about both of these beers is they both finish almost exactly the same gravity, right? It's, it's right about 1012. So that's that's my big thing with double IPAs is that finish them dry mm -hmm. because if not, it's just this sweet alcoholic mess. Kind of like some of our friends. Sweet alcoholic messes. Yeah. I didn't say you. Some of our friends. Present company accepted. Like you, buddy. <laughs> you too, buddy. So which is your favorite? What do you like? It's kind of Sophie's choice. Oh, You're going to make me choose? All right, let's make it the crying game. Now you have to choose. <laughs> <laughs> now it becomes an even more loaded, <laughs> uncomfortable exactly. question. Mm. I could drink more of the 1469 because to me what makes just personally, totally subjectively outside the BJCP guidelines, I like a double IPA to be like a roundhouse kick. <laughs> Rather than a dragon that, kick. <laughs> that, you know, could knock down a wall, but I like it to be precisely placed. I like there to be some finesse and some artistry you to it. You don't care about the accuracy, you just care about the precision. I, I dig that. Mm -hmm. You know, people who like the really, really aggressive, super aesthetic, super grippy hop character, 1056 would be excellent. Yep, absolutely. That's, that's, you can't go wrong with this recipe at all. I mean, that, Nathan and I were talking, let's make something that you can't, abs that anybody can absolutely make as long as you, you don't, as long as, you, as long as you're thorough in the mash and stuff like that, you don't make things too fat. What, what other yeasts would you try in this recipe or any double IPA? Mm, probably one of my very favorite for anything bone dry and you want a little complexity to it is Nottingham. The dry Nottingham ale yeast, it drops like a rock. It does a good job of fermenting out, you know, and it accentuates both the hops and the bitterness. It does a really good job. The super high gravity yeast, anything, the, the, the whip red dry strain, not the actual, you can actually use the whip red dry if you want, but the, the was the white that says whip red dry on it, right? That one, that does a really good job of, of cleaning things up too and you don't have a whole lot. The London Ale, the 1028 from Y East, there, that, that is extremely good. That does a really good job and it has this little mineral, mineral character to it too. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a lot of minerals in your water, number one, when you make one of these, you probably should put them in. But number two, it just does a really nice job. It's, it's all personal preference. See something you like, just make sure it's got, just make sure it attenuates highly. That's, I think that's, that's the biggest, and, you know, the same thing, use enough yeast, oxygenate, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you should be making the beer right in the first place. We're talking about, you're, you know how to make the beer right. You're doing everything right now. You just want to do, you know, something a little different. So before we came over here, mm. we tossed some questions to Brewing TV fans on Facebook. What are your favorite double IPAs? Yes, sir. We got a lot of Pliny the Elders, mm -hmm. Pliny the Elders, depending on whether or not you're a classic scholar. Hey, Charlie, are you a classic scholar? Do you say Pliny or Pliny? We heard Bell's Hop Slam, Central Waters Illumination, yep. Heretic Evil Cousin, Founders Double Trouble. Asked for their favorite techniques for brewing double IPAs. We heard a lot of stuff that you already said. Use some sugar to dry it out from Matthew Spitz. Kyle Schmidt says make sure you have a healthy yeast starter. Drive the attenuation down. Steve Faro, apologies if I'm pronouncing that wrong, suggested Randall's. For pushing it through a Randall for extreme hop character. Let's talk, you mentioned hop stands, like yep. the hop stands. You yes. mentioned this in the, uh, one of the evenings of the Upper Mississippi Mash Out yep. recently. Don't be afraid of DMS. Yeah. Long there's, hop stands. There's, you know, every homebrew book basically tells you what to be afraid of and what you're going to do wrong. Goblins. Go goblins, you know, wheezy boogers, you know, hoot nannies in the, in the closets. Whatever they are, they always say, you know, it has to. They have to say, these are the possible things that can happen. And these are how they happen. But when it comes to the, it comes to the hop stands, the idea is that uh, you're treating it more like a commercial setting where, where they whirlpool no matter what. Mm -hmm. So you whirlpool, you whirlpool in, 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 your, in your, your either your whirlpool vessel or it's just your brew, your, your, your brew kettle whirlpool. So basically as, as the wort is circulating really fast, the heat's already off. You, you can throw hops in just a little before or right at knockout. And as it whirlpools, you're going to get, let alone all these hops in there. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be boiling. Mm -hmm. There's many papers that are written showing, showing the temperature, let's say, at 180 Fahrenheit, every two degrees up, and the extraction of alpha acids, right? It doesn't have to be boiling. What boiling does is agitate it. So as it's agitating, it's extracting more. It's the same thing as a whirlpool. It's kind of like a boil, as, but for the agitation. So as it's spinning around, as you leave these hops and as they spin, 
they're going to be extracting more and more. So when you put them at the end, there's really nothing driving things off, right? The, the, that huge boil that's pushing all the gases, pushing all the, pushing all the, 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 the um, essential oils and stuff off, you're not going to have that. So as it spins around, it's, let alone are you going to clear your beer faster and you're going to have a much, much, much nicer break, you're also extracting all this aroma and all this flavor. Up to 80 minutes, you're, you're safe and you'll extract a lot of things. Over 80 minutes, it's just detrimental. So for a beer like a double IPA, 60 minutes, a nice 60 minute whirlpool at knockout, you're gonna get this huge, you're gonna get this huge aroma. People call it hot burst, people call it all kinds of crazy things, right? It's just, it's just an extended steep. In a home brewing committee, it, otherwise it's just a whirlpool. Uh, a buddy was telling me that Rogue does a lot of just, they'll, they'll do a hop at 90 minutes or whatever, and then the rest they'll throw in the whirlpool. Because that's much how much aroma, excuse me, and flavor you get out of the whirlpool. You really want that, but also you don't get that grassiness that you get a lot of the time. With dry hopping. With dry hopping. So that's another, that's a whole nother topic that, 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 that I don't even, I don't even know if you can Google it. It's one of those things. It's like Google, Google will fail you. You have to know a guy. You have to know a guy. But yeah, I would absolutely give that a shot, this, the extended steep. It's, it's one of, it's, it's, I get, I guess it's one of those secrets. If Not I'm giving anybody secret away, I apologize because here, but here we are. <laughs> it's one of those things to get an extremely fresh hop character into your beer without necessarily making it horribly hoppy either. Mm -hmm. right? There's a huge difference between hoppiness and bitterness. There can, there can be beers that, are, that you taste them like, wow, that's really hoppy, and there's no bitterness really at all to it. There's other beers that they don't really smell like anything, but then you taste them and like your taste buds just kind of slough right off. I know a guy, his name is Northern Brewer. Do you? Pretty fresh hops. Is he? Like yeah. you were saying, recipes are recipes, but the freshness of the hops is kind of key. Turnover, exactly. turnover is crucial. The higher the turnover you have, the more freshness you'll have with your ingredients. Absolutely, it's the most important. You know what, go ahead. No, no, you finished. Well, there was one mm -hmm. damn point that I need to make that I'm sick and tired of all this crap about people and using extract, using the, the hop extract. Use it. It's there for a reason. People keep continuing to want to shove these all these tons of hops into these double IPAs, and it tastes like It just completely is horrible. You have the ability now to use this hop extract. It saves you on the amount of beer you can make. It saves on the actual quality of the beer, and all you're doing is trying to get that bitterness because, frankly, this is just a pissing contest anyways, right? It's a double IPA. I want a Brazilian hops in there, so let's get them in there. Let's not, you know, him and haw and how we're going to get them in there now. It's like, well, well, I'm going to make a double IPA that you can't even taste your face on. You know how many hops I used? Probably too many. Probably too many. You know, a lot of the big boys use it. I don't mean, like, the really macro ones. It's like they know right away from sheer volume. It's like, if I want this bitterness, I'm going to add this extract. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Now, because wonderful Northern Brewer has brought to you the hop shot, there's no reason not, not to give it a shot at least. You're not gonna see any difference other than the fact that you're gonna have so much more beer left over. You make a double IPA with regular hops, you get a pound or so in the five gallons, and you're gonna, it's gonna take up an awful lot of volume. An awful lot of volume. You wind up with a three gallon batch. Oh yeah, right? You had talked about finding new hop combinations. Yep. That seemed like a great springboard to talk about the elephant in the room that is hey. Simcoe oh. and Citra. Yep. Demand exceeds acreage. Oh, by far. Oh, these are these are really popular hops. A lot of people like them in beers like this. Mm -hmm. What sort of stuff are you looking to as an alternative, as a home brewer and a pro brewer? The original stuff. People don't. That's not fancy or fun anymore. People are like, oh, I don't want to talk about that. No, no, no. Cascade, the green bean casserole of the hops. The green bean casserole of hops. <laughs> when you mix that with things, when you mix that with things, you have no idea what it is. It just it's just this, this really nice grapefruity hop. Mm -hmm. the Brewer's Gold, the original grapefruit. Absolutely. They have so many acres and acres of this stuff they're trying to throw it at people. People don't want to use it. Like, oh no, it's not. No, no, I want that citra. If you really love a hop, there's no changing it. You can't get around it. You'll see that people that go from home brewing into pro brewing without doing a lot of research will walk right in saying, this is my recipe. And the guy will look at you like, hand it right back to you and be like, you can't have that hop until 2017. First of all, you're brand new. You, you got no pull. Second of all, Nobody with pole can get that hop before 2016. You know, it's kind of like you're talking about the citra, all the, these new huge hops, mm -hmm. Apollo, Bravo, Calypso coming out. They've already been sold to the people that are much bigger. You guys have a great contract with, with your guys, and you can get you can get limited quantities of these, so at least people can try them in small quantities. We should probably wrap. Thank you so much, Chris England. Yes, sir. I look forward to a nice, dry, dank, hoppy. Double IPA from Poor Decisions Brewing Company soon. Yes, sir. For Nathan Explosion, for Jake Keeler on assignment, and for everyone at Northern Brewer, thanks for watching. All for brew. Brew for all, buddy. Yes, Cheers, sir. man. Cheers, man. On the next episode of Brewing TV, Chip's back with another solo shot brew day.
He's making a chocolate stout with homegrown hops and squares of real unsweetened chocolate. And for an extra treat, he ices some of the beer and offers side-by-side tasting notes. Brewing TV, episode 60. Ice is nice. Post online April 20th, 2012. There's a lot of old hops out there. Really trust your horse, your source, and your horse, I guess, too. It'd be a good idea, right? Mm-hmm. You know a you're guy. Your hop horse, you gotta yeah. know a guy. You know, and if you open up a few bags of hops and they all kind of smell the same, you know instantly right then that that place's hops are bad. If they all kind of start smelling like carrot tops, you know, kind of aged carrot top with kind of almost a caramely thing underneath the it. The vegetable, not the comedian. The right? vegetable, not the... <laughs> he's, 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 he's beefcake, though. I don't want to say anything about that, dude. He's going to come out here like, look a hatchet. Look what you do with hatchet. Whack. <laughs> and he's not going to do like this joke that doesn't make any sense. Hatchet, get a hatchet. Whack. And he's just hit you with it. I'm not stepping to that. No? Okay. No. I'm not. I'm just gonna whirlpool for 60 minutes like a pacifist. No. Charlie. Charlie agrees. Mm-hmm. Completely. Mm-hmm. Here comes Carrot Top. Here comes Carrot Top. <laughs>